Psalm 63 is going to be our study this morning. I'd like to read it. And then I'd like to ask that the Lord would fulfill this psalm in each member and in the life of our church corporately. Let's read this together. Psalm 63, beginning in verse 1. A psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. O God, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water, so I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name I will lift up my hands. My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips. When I remember you upon my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. For you have been my help. And in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. But those who seek to destroy my life shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. Let's take a minute and ask God to help us this morning. Lord, I pray that this psalm would be fulfilled in our church. I pray it would be fulfilled in my life. I pray it would be fulfilled in every member. I pray you would give us a thirst and satisfaction in you that nothing else will satisfy. I pray in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, for most people, close-up pictures make them uncomfortable. If you've ever had the experience of someone taking a camera and putting it inches away from your nose, uh, typically most people, there are strange ones out there, but most people push back a bit. They prefer more of a long distance shot, doesn't show quite the accurate realities uh, of a close-up shot, all the blemishes, all the needs. Well, this psalm is David taking a close-up picture, not just of his face, but of his soul. It's David's close-up snapshot of the soul that he holds up to his Israelite brothers and sisters in this book of worship for the old covenant people. And he says, here it is. Here is my soul. And as David often does and often is in the Old Testament, there is a, a kind of a, an idealized Israelite where he, he presents himself in, a, in an idealized way. David was very aware he wasn't a perfect man, but he's, he's showing what a soul should look like that is fully thirsting and hungering after God. This psalm paints a picture of what men and women are meant to be. This is what we were meant to be. This is our ideal situation. If you want to know what ideal humanity is, this is it. This is ideal humanity. It is humanity in desperate, satisfied fellowship with God. Desperate, satisfied fellowship with with God. That is humanity in its ideal. That's the way God intends men and women to be. And David describes this with all these marvelous metaphors. But before we walk through the metaphors, I want to ask a question, because sometimes when we look at the Psalms as Christians, we just sort of automatically take them as direct commands to us. And the problem with that is, first of all, 
it would be overwhelmingly condemning <laughs> to read this only as a direct command to us because, frankly, uh, I don't look like David. Not fully, not completely. And so we have to understand and process how do we relate this to us? And then we can walk through it, I think, more fully understanding. Well, I think there's two ways that, that the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ affects our reading of the Psalms. Two ways. The coming of the Lord Jesus affects how we read the Psalms so that we read it accurately. Jesus said when he rose from the dead that all of the scriptures, and that includes Psalms, related to him. They told about him. And so we have to ask the question, how does this psalm tell us about Jesus so that we understand its meaning for us accurately? Two ways, I think, because Jesus is the God-man. So if you want a, a, a simple, uh, easy way to ask, how does the Lord Jesus relate to the psalms? I think asking, how does his manhood and how does his deity relate to the psalms? Here, here's two ways. I think, number one, Jesus fulfills the perfect picture of the worshiper that we see in the Psalms. So if you go back to Psalm 1, where it says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. On his law he meditates day and night. In the ultimate sense, Jesus Christ is the righteous man portrayed in these kinds of Psalms. In the ultimate sense, he is the one who ultimately went into the wilderness and faithfully worshipped God without fail. So in one way we read psalms like this to kind of present an idealized worshiper is it points us to the perfection of Jesus Christ. And we can say, how good is it that Jesus fulfilled the perfect worshiper in my place? When he went out in the desert and he resisted every temptation and he declared, the Lord alone will you serve and man does not live by bread alone but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. He was in our place being the worshiper that we must be to have relationship with God. The New Testament would describe that as justification. The righteousness of Jesus here described as a passionate, unflagging, undistracted, unmitigated worshiper ultimately is Jesus Christ. And he has become the worshiper whose worship stands in for us. That's one way we read this song. In union with Jesus, there's also another way we read this song. Because Jesus isn't just a man, as we know, he is the God-man. He is the God-man who is the mediator. And the New Testament says that God has revealed himself in Jesus in a greater way than any other revelation, greater than the law, greater than anything we saw in Moses. Jesus reveals the character of God. Jesus is Yahweh on display. So when we look at Psalms like this, where David is seeking after Yahweh, after God, after the God of the covenant, the God of the sanctuary, the God of steadfast love, the God who satisfies, we can also see Jesus as the one who reveals that God most clearly to us. That's why Jesus calls himself the living water, the bread from heaven, the rock for our souls. He's revealing himself to be Yahweh on display in his greatest display of God's glory. So when we read this, we can read it those two different ways. Number one, David showcases a, an idealized worshiper ultimately fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Jesus is the worshiper that stands in for us. But secondly, in Jesus, having our record standing before God, it is as though everything about this psalm is true of us because we have put on Jesus Christ. Marvelous good news. Marvelous good news. Before God, it is as though God says to you, you have always earnestly sought me. You have always fainted for me as in a dry and weary land. You have always come into my presence eagerly and willingly. You have always remembered me in the watches of the night. You have always trusted me in the weariness of this world. That's justification. And we have to read that into the Psalms when these idealized manhood psalms come up to us. We also, in Jesus, are called to reflect the worship that Jesus offers. We never replace it, but we do reflect it. 
We've studied that in Ephesians, right? Because of our union with Jesus, we're to walk out what he has done for us. We're to live out in obedience what he has done to save us. We apply that to this psalm. It means that we should be striving to reflect in greater and greater ways the righteous worshiper who has saved us by his righteousness. So when we're reading this psalm, I know that's a little more complicated than just reading and saying, yeah, I should seek God like David, but I think it's a little more fully biblical. I I think when we receive the righteousness of Jesus, who is the perfect worshiper, and then we reflect that worship in full confidence that we're not doing this to earn salvation with God. He already did that, but we are doing it to reflect and seek after him as God's greatest display of himself. So that's the accent I want to talk about as we walk through these passages. How can we seek after God revealed in Christ in the way that David models and Jesus perfected? How can we we live that out as Christians? How can we live out the union with Christ that we have been given? Because this psalm, it, it reveals a kind of lived out fellowship with God, that should be the the heritage and the privilege of every person united to God in Christ. It it reveals what the close-up of our lives should increasingly look like. So let's let this word zoom in on us. And since Jesus has already fulfilled it, we can let it zoom in on us without fear of condemnation. We can embrace the conviction that comes We can be honest and say if this doesn't describe us at all, and we can seek grace from our Lord Jesus Christ to transform us. That's what we want for the church. Safe in the finished work of Jesus, we want to run after a fellowship with God that is as comprehensive as David's portrait described here. So let's walk through with that that backdrop, that frame, How can we apply this? I want to ask three questions that I think draw out what Dave's describing here. What David describes, I think we can draw out with three questions. Number one, are you thirsty for God? Are we thirsty for God? David begins with this metaphor of thirst. Oh God, he says, you are my God. Earnestly, I seek you. I seek you. You are my God. Earnestly, I seek you, David says. And in Christ, we can say the same thing. We should say the same thing. I seek you. You, through the finished work of Christ, have become my God, and therefore I seek you. David, as he often does, describes this in ways his contemporaries would would immediately understand, and even we can understand to some degree. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh thirsts faints for you, and here's the metaphor, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So he's describing what then would have been very common for us is unheard of in many cases, where you're in the desert, you're in the wilderness, there is no water readily available, and your flesh itself begins to faint, begins to sink out of a desire to be satisfied, to be nourished. So he says, look, if if you want to know what I feel like in terms of you, it's like a man in the desert who doesn't have water and he feels his flesh beginning to sink under the the thirst for it. That's how I feel about you, God. That's how I want to be with you, to be fellowshipping with you. It's like a man who is his feeling his body begin to shut down unless he can have the one thing he craves above all else. He says, in this way, I have looked upon you in the sanctuary. So this isn't just a momentary longing in a a suffering moment. This has been the pattern of his life. I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, he says, beholding your power and your glory. He says, I've seen you. I know who you are. I have seen your greatness, your power and your glory on display. And I have decided this, that your steadfast love, your covenant love, your unchanging love, your love that will never let me go, that love, here's what I've decided, having seen you, it's better than life itself. Life is as nothing compared to knowing the God of covenant love. 
on display in his sanctuary. So the result is, I will bless you as long as I live, and in your name, in other words, entrusting myself to you, I will lift up my hands. And here's where that revelation of God in Christ comes in and makes this psalm amplify even further. David's meditations on his hunger for God sent him to the sanctuary, which was the place where sinners could be reconciled with the holy God through sacrifice. But as we know, because we've studied our our New Testament scriptures, that was an imperfect and temporary display of God's power and glory in saving sinners. It was helpful, but imperfect and incomplete. And in the New Testament, as we read through the Gospel of John, even as a church, Jesus reveals himself to be in his person the new sanctuary where new sacrifice will be offered completely and permanently to save sinners, where the glory of God is on display in the cross and resurrection of Jesus Christ, where God's wrath and his love are simultaneously poured out through Jesus Christ on the cross. So where David would look to the sanctuary as the best, the most glorious symbol he could look to for God's displaying his power and his glory. And he was saying, I've seen you in the sanctuary. I've smelt the smoke of the sacrifices. I've seen the blood that atoned for sins. I have seen the priest going into the Holy of Holies. I've seen those things. And you know what it makes me want to do? Worship you as long as I live. It reminds me that your steadfast love is better than life. A New Testament Christian could write a better song. And David would have if he'd lived now. He would say, I have been to the place called Calvary. I have seen your death on that cross in my place. I have seen the wrath of God poured on the perfect worshiper so that the power of God in salvation would be displayed. I've I've seen it. I've seen Jesus, the new sanctuary, where sinners can freely come in to the presence of God. And you know what it tells me? Your love is better than life. Paul might have said, whatever gain I've had, I count as loss compared to the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may know him and be found in him in his resurrection. David's just saying the same thing. When I looked at your sanctuary and the steadfast love that forgives sinners through sacrifice, what can I say? Your love is better than life. Now, Jesus simultaneously fulfills our imperfect thirst and is the one whom we thirst after. Our imperfect thirst was paid for in him and he becomes the fountain that displays God's glory that we're thirsting after like a man in the wilderness dying of thirst, thirst for water. Now, let's let's pause a moment before we determine that our quiet times, our devotional pursuit of God is going to be better this week. I mean, it's just going to be better because I heard Psalm 63. Pause for a moment. Don't go there yet. Don't go to change yet. Let's just allow the the image to affect us with its, its, its majesty. How frequently do you thirst for water? Every few hours? Can you go a day? By the end of the day, I'm thirsty. In normal life, let alone in a wilderness. I've heard that a a human being can survive three days without water. Fourth day, uh, normally they're going to die. How many days can I go without fellowship with the Lord? Five days? A week? David is using this analogy intentionally to bring conviction to say let's examine let's take a snapshot of our soul is there this kind of thirst for an even greater revelation of God than even David had are we thirsty for God in the biblical definition of thirst are we are you thirsty for God am I thirsty for God this way 
Do you long for him the way you would long for water? Can we say honestly and genuinely, your love is better than life. I'd rather die than be out of fellowship with you, is David's statement. Paul said the same thing. Better by far to die and be with the Lord Jesus. Now, I have to stay on your account to serve you, but in my preference, better to be with him than to have life itself. But let me invite us to embrace the conviction that I think inevitably comes from this psalm. Are we thirsting for God? Are we thirsting for God? We have every reason to. We have every reason to. We have a sanctuary in the heavens, undefiled by man, permanent, where our high priest has sat down, having finished the atonement for sinners, so that all who claim him can draw near boldly and with confidence to the Lord, without fear of condemnation. We have every reason to. Are we thirsting for God? Are you thirsting for God? You know, sometimes I think we, we don't thirst for God because it doesn't come natural to our flesh. It, it doesn't come natural to us. Thirsting for God doesn't often result in the immediate kind of satisfaction that results from earthly pleasures and joys. Just to use a silly example, um, I, I, don't, I don't drink Red Bull, the energy drink, but I have tasted it before. I was on a drive one time, and I was afraid I was going to fall asleep, and so I got one of these cans, and, and I just used it just for wakefulness on the road. That's the only time I would recommend ever. Uh, if you like the taste of it, God bless you. I think it's horrific, but uh, it, it, it saved my life probably on the road, so I, I was drinking it. Well, imagine for a moment, if you would, that Red Bull replaced all of the water in the world. What would happen? Well, for the first few hours, there would be a lot of energy everywhere in the world. People would be so hardworking for four hours. I mean, there'd be more work done in four hours. It would be incredible. Athletes would be jumping higher. People would be running faster. There would be a massive amount of energy. And then what would happen? They would crash. And maybe, maybe, maybe day two, they might get almost as high as they did day one. It wouldn't be quite as high, but it, they, they, they re refill Red Bull, they get almost as high, and there'd be energy again. And what would happen? They'd crash worse. Day three, boy, even the peak would start to look a little lame, and the crash would be worse. Do you know everything we substitute for God is exactly like that? God is not our slave. He has no responsibility to give us the kind of instant, pleasurable, effortless high that often comes when we substitute things for him. Why do we think idols work that way? Well, it's because that's all they have. They can't match the kind of enduring joy that's found in the steadfast love and the power and glory of God. So the only thing that idols have is a kind of instantaneous high that distracts us. It might be an idol of sleep. It might be an idol of food. It might be an idol of drink. It might be an idol of entertainment or relationships or computer games or movies or television or work. Write your own name in Sharpie on your idol of choice, but it's whatever substitutes for God that we look to to satisfy us to distract us, to fill our lives with meaning, that thing, it often gives instant distraction and a big crash because we crave it again. God often works in the reverse. Often with God, the sense of satisfaction takes more time. If you ever tried to, to regain some momentum in your personal devotional life, you found this to be true go through a season where there's been a slackness, a lack of seeking God. And the first couple of days you go back to reading your Bible, 
it's it's hard to get excited about it again. You read and it's like, man, I don't, I'm not getting a lot out of this. This didn't hit me emotionally the same way that movie I watched last night. Just immediately, I was hooked. It's not the same thing somehow. And even day two and even day three, it, it, it feels like, well, it's good, but I'm not, it, it's more, it feels more like work than immediate result. And yet over time, the high of joy in God, it endures. It lingers. It lasts. It stays sustaining. It feeds you and, and nourishes you throughout the day. And then even the next day, you maybe are still remembering something. Very different from that instant high. The water of God's word and fellowship with God is life eternal. Jesus said it wells up into a life-giving fountain of eternal water within us. Let's ask the question, is this kind of thirst for God defining our life? Is it defining your life? Sometimes we, we don't thirst for God because we're afraid that God will not satisfy us in the end. That's why I love the second turn this psalm makes. You notice in verse 5, there's sort of a, a new theme. I would ask this question to define it. Are we satisfied in God? Are we thirsting for God? In the verse, verse 5, David switches from his thirst and where he's looked historically and encountered God historically to stir up his soul, and he moves into a, a confidence of satisfaction. He says in verse 5, My soul will be satisfied as with fat and rich food. My mouth will praise you with joyful lips when I remember you on my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. And he has a reason, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I will sing for joy. Here's the summation. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. He's, he's saying, David is saying, I will be satisfied. I, I reject the lie that God will not ultimately satisfy my soul. I know that he will satisfy my soul. The language here is of, of being stuffed or full to bursting. I, I'm, I'm satisfied with fat and rich food, he says. And he says, not only is my, my soul satisfied, my day will be so enraptured by you that even in the middle of the night, when I'm wakeful, you will be on my mind. He says, when I remember you on my bed and meditate on you in the watches of the night. The Israelites would have divided the night into three watches. And he says, when those watches come, if I'm awake, what's on my mind is you. And he says, the reason my mind is on you is that you have been my help. And I'm like a little bird under the wings of its mother in the shadow of your wings. I will sing for joy. The satisfaction I have with fellowship with you is a kind of, of welling up joyfulness of protection because though my soul clings to you, ultimately it's your right hand that holds me up. We can say that to be true of Christ because he's our rock and our redeemer. He's the refuge of our souls. He's the one that atones for our sins. He's our righteousness, our justification. A sinner who is laid bare before the wrath of God can come to God in Christ and have their guilt and judgment exchanged for righteousness and acceptance. As David would put it, in the shadow of your wings, I can sing for joy. My soul is safe in this refuge. I'm satisfied with the good news of the gospel. It satisfies me. Are we satisfied in God? Let me ask you a question this way. Let's imagine that your day is filled, as I imagine it is, with moments when your mind and every brain cell is straining to accomplish a certain activity. If you're like me, it's hard to actually think about God when you are, are literally trying to figure out this problem uh, on the computer. I'm not saying that like we can't use our brains to think about things, okay? Or I'm trying to deal with this child and it's not like I'm meditating on God at precisely that moment. But most of our days are filled with blank moments. 
moving from this task to that task. In the middle of this conversation, my mind is running and I'm, I'm thinking about what I'm going to say in response. And then I'm driving somewhere. And then I'm working in the yard. And then I'm talking to my spouse. And, and then she has to leave for just a moment. My mind's back in, in a blank state on something. My mind is rolling. Let me ask you this. Is your mind on God? Imagine for a moment that your brain is like a computer with a screensaver. Sometimes you're actively doing something. But sometimes you're not, and in those moments, is your mind on God? Does God pop up? 30 seconds of inactivity. Or when you're doing mindless work, does God pop up? Or are you thinking about yourself? We think about all kinds of things. We think about how I'm doing today. Have I made progress today? How am I feeling today? How are they doing today? How do I feel like how they're doing in relation to how I'm doing? How, how, how's my job going today? How's my family going today? Am I making progress in godliness today? All kinds of things, some legitimate, some illegitimate, that we're thinking about. The question is, how much of our days are spent meditating on who God is and what he has done in Christ to save sinners and bring them into his place of permanent rest? Are we satisfied as with fat and rich food? Is our mouth praising God with joyful lips? Do we remember God in the watches of the night? Can we declare with regularity throughout our day that God is our help and that we can sing for joy in the shadow of his wings? Is our soul, could it be described as clinging to God with confidence because his right hand is upholding us? Are we satisfied in God like David, especially in light of how God has revealed himself in Christ? The third question that I think David is asking, and we could summarize this final three verses, is are we confident in God? David was frequently surrounded by enemies, by enemies who hated God and hated him. And it, we don't know for sure which time this was in the wilderness of Judah, but probably when David was in the wilderness, normally enemies were chasing him. That was normally what was happening when David was in the, we don't know if it was Absalom this time, or is this a reference back to Saul? Uh, when Saul was, we don't know which time it was, but when he's in the wilderness, he's in danger from enemies. And here's what the soul who is fixed on God, who is living in fellowship with God, here's what that soul says. It says, I am confident in God. I'm confident in God. Here's why. Those who seek to destroy my life, ultimately, they shall go down into the depths of the earth. They shall be given over to the power of the sword. They shall be a portion for jackals. But the king shall rejoice in God. All who swear by him shall exult, for the mouths of liars will be stopped. What's David doing? He's saying, look, right now, the world is upside down. Enemies seem powerful. Those who hate God seem to be in prominence. There seems to be the rise of immorality in the land. I am endangered by those who despise me precisely because I love God. I, I am weak and vulnerable and they are strong. But instead of giving in to fear and doubt and worry and anxiety and letting the, the, the torment of that situation be on his mind, his mind is on the future where that will be reversed. The enemies of God will finally be destroyed and those who trust in God will be exalted. He says one day this is going to be reversed. One day anyone who resists God or hates God's people will finally be judged. This is not that day, but I have confidence that day will come. This is not that day, but I have confidence that God will uphold those who seek him with all of their heart. This is not that day, but I have confidence that my refuge will remain secure for eternity. This is not that day, but that day will come. This is the portrait of a man who is walking each day with One of my favorite obscure verses in the Bible, a lot of non-obscure, there's an obscure verse in the Bible, there's, there's a couple of them. One is in Genesis, in a list of obituaries, when people are all dying as a result of the fall, there's a man named Enoch, and he kind of slides into the obituaries, and what it says about him is, Enoch walked with God, and he was not. 
because God took him. In the midst of all these people that are born and then they die, and they're born and then they die, God slips in this little testimony. We don't know anything else about him. Just a little bit. Enoch walked with God, and he was not because God took him. Apparently this man's fellowship with God was going to be an example that the power of death was not ultimate, and he, he wanted to be preserved in Scripture that the lifestyle of those who finally escape death is the lifestyle of walking with God. Walked with God. You could say that that is the definition of the faithful Christian life. It's a life that walks with God. In the same way that we walk with water. In other words, we don't go without it very long. In the same way that we would walk with food. Can't go without it very long. In the same way that we would say, I'd rather have that than anything else in life. It defines us. It shapes our priorities. It's what's on our mind when nothing else is on our mind. He walked with God, he said, and he was not because God took him. Another favorite obscure verse is toward the end of Jacob's life. Jacob has been a massive failure in a number of ways, and yet God redeems him and changes him and restores him, and then he's going to go see his son Joseph. And he ends up in, in Egypt And at one point toward the end of his journey, he he says this, the God who has been my shepherd all my days. You see this little snapshot, just a little moment towards the end of Jacob's life after he's had this journey of, of sin and failure and learning to be weak before God and learning that his own strength is insufficient and learning to be broken by God and to come into God's presence with need and dependence on God's faithfulness. And, and he's able to, to give evidence of that testimony. He says, you know what I would say about God? God has been my shepherd all my life. And Jacob knew about sheep. So he's humbling himself and saying, you know what I'm like? I'm like one of those sheep that has to have everything done for them. That's what I'm like. You know what God's like? He's like a shepherd that has walked by my side every day. Brothers and sisters, are we walking with God? Are we thirsting after God? We have every reason to. Our sins are no longer a barrier between us and God. God's wrath has been turned to favor through the finished work of Jesus Christ. And even if you're here and you're an unbeliever, God invites you to walk with him. Just repent of your sins, claim Jesus as your savior, and you can begin right now to walk with God. And if you're a Christian and you've been united to the perfect worshiper, Are we going with boldness before God with this kind of passion? We have every reason to. He is the satisfaction that we are longing for. He is the enduring water that our souls are thirsting for. He is the bread from heaven that satisfies hungry souls. I wanted to make a pastoral question appeal that I I am putting myself under as well as I'm reading this word and we were praying this week for this area in the life of our church. Let, Let me ask you whether you would say that your life could be described as a walk with God, a thirsting after, a satisfaction in, a in the middle of the night, a better-than-life kind of walk with God? Simple, Simple question would be, how consistently are you fellowshipping with your Lord over His Word and in the fellowship of prayer? Is that a regular walking part of your life? Is engaging with God a regular walking part of what it means for you to do life, for me to do life? Are we walking with God or are we just walking? If I can make a a special appeal to the 
husbands and fathers. Men, are you walking with God? Are we thirsting after God? Are we worshiping God in private? I know we gather, we do it corporately on Sunday, but corporate worship is insufficient. It is it is necessary, but it is insufficient to cultivate a walk with God that is described here. We can't merely hear his word and pray to him once a week. That would be as deadly to our souls as drinking once a week or eating once a week. This must be a regular, delightful, disciplined part of who we are. Men, are we thirsting after God? Let me ask you a a hard, maybe painful question. Would your wives and children describe you as a man who thirsts for private moments with God's word and in his presence? If the answer is no, It is a good thing that Jesus Christ has thirsted in your place. But it is also true that in union with him, we can grow. We can grow. We can become more thirsty. We can become more hungry. We can read his word. We can pray to him such that our children and our wives would begin to say, you are becoming a man who thirsts after God. Let me encourage you, men. There is no greater legacy that you can leave your families. No greater legacy that you can leave your families than this. My husband, my dad, he believed the gospel of Jesus Christ so functionally and deeply that had led him into consistent and regular fellowship with God before his word and in prayer. If you're convicted, join me. I'm convicted too. We should be convicted. We will be convicted until we're in heaven. That's a normal part of the Christian life. But conviction leads to the joy of forgiveness, which leads to the joy of growth. So that we can say with David, my soul will be satisfied with fat and rich food, namely the food of the gospel, the bread of the Son of God who offered himself for us. And in meditation on his work that saves us, we enjoy the good news day after day after day. Man, let me urge you. Take an honest look at your lives. Take an honest look at your schedules. Take an honest look at your family schedules. And let's answer this question honestly before a gracious God. And let's begin. Let's begin to thirst after God. Let's begin to hunger after God. I would encourage you, uh, start with regularity Don't have a a day full of pursuit and then do nothing for a month. I would start with regular, if small, consistent pursuit of reading God's word and studying the gospel and praying to him and trusting your day to him. Live in regularity before God's presence. Let's do that together. If you never have time with your families where you're talking about God and his word, let me encourage you to begin that practice. If you never have time with your wife as spouses to hunger and thirst after God together, let me encourage us, let's begin that practice. If you're a youth, if you're a single, trust me, every other source of distraction and satisfaction is instant high and big crash, and the highs get lower over time. But God wells up like a fountain. It will be hard the first couple of weeks you start reading your Bible, but it will be worth it in the end. John Piper, in his book, When I Don't Desire God, said this, Out of the blue, as it were, I realized that the bar had been raised manageable, duty-defined, decision-oriented, willpower Christianity now seemed easy. And real Christianity 
had become impossible. The emotions, which I was now free to enjoy, proved to be beyond my reach. The Christian life became impossible. That is, it became supernatural. Now, there was only one hope, the sovereign grace of God. God would have to transform my heart to do what a heart cannot make itself do, namely, want what it ought to want. What I'd like to do now is pray that God will do that. Pray that God will cause our hearts to want what they ought to want. I can invite you to, to join with me while we pray. Let's pray for one another. Lord Jesus, we want to be a church that seeks after you. You are worthy to be sought. Lord, you are the living water. You are the bread from heaven. You do satisfy the souls of those who cast all aside and seek you, who entrust their life and their thirst to you. Lord, would you please do this in our church? Cause us to be a, a church that hungers and thirsts after you. Lord, I, I pray especially for the men among us. Lord, would you please make us men that follow hard after Christ, that reflect Christ, Lord, the ultimate worshiper, and, and receive from him both forgiveness and motivation to hunger and thirst after you. Lord, would you, would you cause there to be a distaste in the thirsts of this world, a distaste in the, the things that distract us from you, the false gods, the false fountains that promise peace, and issue nothingness. Or those that have spent their days thinking mostly about themselves, would you turn our eyes outward to you, to delight in and meditate on you? Do this among us, Lord Jesus. And thank you, Lord, for going through the wilderness perfectly in our place. Thank you that even as we do this, we're not earning our way into your presence because you've already done that. Thank you for worshiping God in our place in the wilderness. Thirsting only for God in the wilderness. Rejecting the table of the world in the wilderness in our place perfectly so that we stand before God and our record is perfect seeking worshiper all the time, every moment. And that's the confidence we have coming before you. Thank you, Lord. I'll cause our hearts to become more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.